Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome to episode 118 of an ongoing series where we basically take the camera anywhere we want and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. Lots and lots of people really enjoyed the Portal 2 episode and I've been sitting on the idea of doing a Portal 1 episode for a very long time now. Which I think the big thing that was holding me back this whole time was knowing that Portal 1 is kind of short. But I think you might appreciate the fact that I went forward because some of the stuff that I ended up finding was pretty interesting. And with the absence of length, came with the invention of new content to fill the void. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, I don't even explain it. How about we just finish the intro and show you? So first of all, I want to show you how to boundary break. And the reason why I feel comfortable showing you how to do this is because it seems that Valve as a company is pretty comfortable with people messing around with the dev commands in their own games. So in order to do this for Portal specifically, you go over to the game here and you right click in your library and you go to properties. And then from the first tab that you open up, which is general, you go to set launch options and you type in dash console. This will allow you to push this key here in order to open up the console when you open up the game. And when you do, you just type in SV underscore cheats space one. This allows you to activate the cheats and then you can just type in no clip and there's no problems with this. Now your character can move freely throughout the entire map. You can also access it by pressing the advanced tab in the keyboard settings, but the previous method will allow you to do this with games like Left 4 Dead, which hey, that's great. But with that aside, the developers had this very intentionally in the game, and so there is a little bit of tweaking here that you don't see out of a normal boundary break episode. That tweaking that I'm referring to is that when you step outside the boundaries, you can see that there's a void, which is pretty typical in a lot of games I cover on this show. But here's the thing, there's not always a void outside the boundaries. This is set in place for when you use the dev commands and you go outside the boundaries. Because one thing that you can see once in a while when you boundary break a game is something that's very difficult on the eyes. It's a visual effect that happens when the void does not refresh itself. And when something doesn't refresh itself, you can see a lot of phantom images, sometimes some really bright colors. It's something I try to avoid at all costs on Boundary Break because it's very difficult for a viewer to stomach. But here's a slight problem to that. If the developers inject a void that can refresh itself, it means they can also inject any number of other things. One of which being that some objects get culled out once you're outside the boundaries. That's... that's not good. But I learned a lot about how this system works. One of which being that your character space has to trigger this special event. And so if you kind of edge yourself really, really slight outside the boundaries, you can by all accounts see everything that was supposed to be called out. So like for a very basic example, you know how these cubes here can keep respawning so long as you destroy the cube in the first place and then push a button to spawn another one. Well, there's always a hanging cube outside the boundaries waiting to be dropped in by the game's programming. And like I said, it was very difficult to find in the first place, but just edging yourself very slightly allows you to see it. But look, that isn't to say that there isn't gonna be anything to find outside the boundaries simply because there's a void now placed in the game. Far from it, in fact. Anytime there's an energy pellet in the game, the object used to spawn those energy pellets is always stored outside the boundaries. And it typically looks like these red dots here. I mean, maybe many of you already know this and maybe a couple of you are asking yourselves right now, how does he even know that that spawns the energy pellet? All the maps and all the functions outside the maps, everything. These are assets that are placed in the hands of the players. There are tools made by Valve that are fully accessible to the fans. And so while working on this episode, I would reach out to some people that are very familiar with the software and ask them exactly what's going on. And in fact, this second red dot here shouldn't even be here. It's a leftover asset because on this particular map, there's only one energy pellet and there's supposed to be one red dot for every one energy pellet, making this one completely unused. And it should be stated that these red dots are not exclusive to the energy pellets either. Sometimes while moving around in the void, you can accidentally trigger an inbounds area despite the fact that there are no walls. You know that you've triggered an inbounds area because all of a sudden the refresh on the void is gone. And if you're lucky enough to accidentally stumble into one of these, you might find something. And in this case, we found another aperture cube. When asked what this aperture cube was for, the answer was as simple as just another object used to help spawn in energy pellets. A quick little editor's note, I'm gonna leave in everything that I said before because it's part of the journey of discovery. But I reached out to someone who's a little more familiar with Source and he was saying that what you're looking at is still inbounds and you're just looking at a no draw texture. Here's what a no draw texture looks like in the map editor. And he was saying that entities in Source can't be outside the level. And so everything gets housed inside these bubbles known as no draw. And what you end up looking at is the no draw. And according to the Source, which is Quentin Svensky, the void is behind that no draw. Okay, 
video, let's take a little bit of a break from the technical side of things so that we can just talk about something that's a little easier on the brain. I think a lot of people want to know about the ending of the game and there's three key scenes that are worth exploring and for right now let's just focus on one, which is the outdoor area. As part of the ending sequence of the game, your character is laying down on the ground and you get a glimpse of sweet, sweet freedom. But unfortunately, you're then dragged by probably a claw and you are placed back in the facility. Now that glimpse of the outside area is by no means an exaggeration, it's pretty much just a glimpse. But this entire area is rendered in real time which means it exists. And where does it exist? Well, in the last area of the game, the map shares all of these areas together in one. And so taking yourself outside the boundaries and exploring over in this direction can show you the outdoor area, which means you can now get a better look at this skybox here. Almost looks like something out of Kankamangas Highway in New Hampshire. And the platform itself shows you a much better look at the security booth. Now, outside of that, you would think there wouldn't be that much to see. You got the robotic remains here, of course. That's what you're supposed to see. But there are two things here that you're not allowed to see. One of which being a box of beans, which is clearly the texture for the can of beans placed over a box of ammunition instead, as well as a radio. Seems kind of random, doesn't it? Well, it's not as random as you might think. The box of beans does have a function attached to it. What this little guy is responsible for is that animation that you see as you're being dragged away by the claw. I should note the fact as well that I was able to manipulate the camera in a way to see behind me and uh, you can see that there is no physical claw dragging you. It's simply an animation. Now as for the radio, uh, this one gets a little bit weird. If you were to inject a standard weapon into the game and aim it down at the radio, you'd see that the radio bleeds. Now. Why does it bleed? I can tell you right now, all the other radios don't do that, and nor should they. But this one does because it's assigned as an NPC. And what this little guy does is it creates all the sound effects used during the ending cutscene. And so lo and behold, this whole time you had a generic actor to your immediate right, feeding you all those wonderful bits of the game's presentation. <laughs> and now that we have all that out of the way, let's do a zoom out of this area to give you just a look at the scope of how much of this area you don't get to see. A lot of people are asking me what happens to the companion cube after you drop it into the chute. Also a somewhat related question that we'll get to in a second. They also want to know what happens when you take a cube or the companion cube through to the next floor. And to answer that, we need to talk about triggers. And the wonderful thing about triggers, at least in a Valve game, is that you can activate physical representation of triggers. And so now that we have the triggers activated, we can see all sorts of funny things. Those steps that are supposed to break off as you step on them, guess what? They got trigger boxes. That little bit of dialogue you hear as you pass through that doorway. The experiment is nearing its conclusion. Trigger box and the companion cube. Drop the companion cube into the chute. Here's a trigger to set off the dialogue as well as open the door for you. And then here's the other trigger to remove the cube from the map which also means there's a trigger to get rid of these objects as you're trying to head towards the elevator. And so to answer the question, what would happen if you took a cube onto an elevator, we got to remove that trigger. So we got the trigger removed and we have the cube on the elevator. I got to say to my surprise, taking the cube with you and activating this trigger allows you to take the cube into the next map. There isn't much to say about what you can do with this cube in the new map other than, of course, doing some sequence breaking, so you can use your imagination there. There's also a trigger as you're going up the elevator shaft, and if you fail to activate this trigger, you will not find the next floor at the top of this elevator, because the next map hasn't loaded. This is the trigger for the next map. That's why the game loads. Another popular viewer request, which you can always follow me on Twitter if you ever want to leave one, is how do the portals work? Now, I make no bones about it. If you want to really break this down on a mechanical level, there are videos available out there that can teach you every technical nuance behind it. But to break it down in the most basic terms possible, what you see is a camera pointed from the opposite portal and viewed through the lens of the portal you placed. And when you start to walk through the portal, at a certain point your character is then warped from one position on the map to another. In fact, if we made the camera third person and we showed the character model slowly moving through this portal, you can see the exact moment in which the character model warps from one position to another. And oh my goodness, going through the portal with Shell in third person is absolutely terrifying. If you move around and manipulate yourself in certain ways, uh, Shell's eyes don't even know what to do with themselves anymore. You can get some really creepy stares. You can also get her to go cross-eyed. Playing portal in third person should be outlawed. 
All right, let's talk about areas that can't be seen by the player. For example, this one right here, there is this deceptive little scene where you're trying to walk towards the other end of this hallway, and then all of a sudden all the pistons start activating and you can't get to that other side and you get trapped down below. My question is, what is on that other side then, since you're not allowed to get there? Well, with the exception of a couple of reused assets, there isn't much to see outside of the unrefreshed void. How about these crevices up here that expose some light? Going past the boundaries up here can show you that there is a shared room between these two different platforms. However, outside of that, there isn't too much to see. And then how about all these observation rooms? What's going on inside there? Well, I checked every single one and there isn't too much to see here. Most of them just have monitors that you were able to see at later stages of the game, as well as the occasional desk and chair. And after you beat the game, there's a unique title screen, and I wanted to show you what that looks like in full. Poking the camera around can show you the companion cube off to the right, although that is already a secret that is supposed to be shown to the player. If you wait a full minute on the title screen, the camera will pan over to look at it, but one of the things that it doesn't do is show you the door that's off to the left here, or the wall that's completely behind you. For some reason, this is a completely encapsulated room. And then there's the board room here. Now, this is a room that cannot be accessed by the player by normal means, so let's poke around inside and see what we can find. Now there's a lot of clipboards in here and most of these I notice are used throughout the entire game. The only one that I couldn't seem to find myself, you know, it, it could be out there somewhere and I just happened to miss it. But I still think it's a responsibility of mine to show you what I couldn't find at least. It's a clipboard that talks about the Mark V hazardous environment suit, which is a reference to the suit that is used in Half-Life 2 and it becomes pretty apparent why you don't have access to this room. The biggest reason being that if you move the projector, it still projects the images on the screen and the developers didn't do anything to account for when you shift or move the projector. Also, the theater projector reads Ikey Theater Projector, as well as a serial number underneath. This is a real theater projector. Here's an image of one right here. This is the X-T5 version, and as you can see, it's incredibly similar. You know, I'd be very curious to see if Valve got the copyright to use this image in their game. Something similar happened in the Silent Hill 2 episode where the Levi's jeans logo was on the button of someone's pants. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure you can't do that. And then for the 17th test room, there's an area that is not meant to be out of bounds. This is an area that is used when you switch to the advanced maps after completing the game. But when loading regular maps, these aren't supposed to be here. So for this to be floating out of bounds is something left behind by the developer. And once again, you can see here that it's so segmented off that if you look over into the areas where there should be doors or at least more of a hallway, you can see once again the unrefreshed void. Now to jump back into what we were talking about towards the beginning of the episode, we got more of the ending environments. You might remember this tunnel here where Shell gets dragged through and it's all in first person and there's nice sound effects and everything. We talked about it. The radio causes those sound effects and everything. It's very interesting stuff, but I combed every inch of this thing. There wasn't anything that was particularly interesting. There was a couple of doors and warning signs, but that's typical stuff that you see throughout your entire adventure in Portal. No, but what I'm going to show you is what it looks like going through this tunnel cutscene in third person. Because who doesn't love their immersion broken by the idea of the main protagonist constantly banging her head through all the pipes and girders. And of course, this tunnel takes you down to the very last thing you see before the staff roll. In its original context, it's kind of creepy. It certainly doesn't feel like a happy ending now, does it? But if we were to, say, illuminate this room and effectively take away its moody lighting and also walk around in this area freely, it's not as intimidating. It's very clear that this area is basically a storage room with nothing else really going for it. You can interact with the companion cube as per usual, but you cannot interact with the cake. But with that aside, let's just spin the camera around one of these maps. Because like I said, despite some of the objects being called out, most of the map, and typically all of the map, is rendered all at once. Which makes the view very interesting. Hey, thank you so much for watching guys, I, I really appreciate it. This is uh, me, I'm the, the man behind the voice I suppose. Um, if you are subscribed to the channel, there is a video that I really recommend you check out. It didn't really get a whole lot of views, but I can stand by it saying that it's quality stuff. It was a 25th anniversary documentary interview with five of the original developers on the Donkey Kong Country team. It kind of got buried by the algorithm, either A, because the marketing wasn't the same as the typical Boundary Break episode, or B, it uh, got age-gated. Uh, at the start and then we fixed it, but the views never kind of showed up afterwards So if we can get some support on that video, that'd be amazing. I guarantee it'll be worth your time 
Outside of that, if you're a new subscriber, Portal 2, Half-Life 2, I'll throw them up on the screen right now, and uh, enjoy. <laughs> I consider them one of my better episodes. So I, I hope that this one caught your attention, and hopefully these other two videos can cement whether or not you want to stick around. Anyways, guys, take it easy, and thank you so much for watching.